Hi, everyone. Um, as Elton said, I am a technical evangelist for AWS, uh, which is a fancy way of saying, because I have to explain this a lot, that I am just a regular software engineer, but I go around and I speak at a lot of conferences and I write papers about software engineering instead. Um, so talking a little bit about something today that's kind of close to home. Um, so I was an ops engineer before I got into uh, evangelism for AWS, uh, was one of the first users of ECS. Uh, which is Amazon's container platform. Uh, real life situation, me on pager duty, 2 a.m. And I get woken up and then I'm like, what, what is this? What is going on? And it's like, all of your cluster instances are out of disk space. I'm like, well, that's interesting. I wonder how. And this is like right after we'd moved kind of our production stuff over to Docker and ECS. And it turns out that when you just pull the stock image directly out of the Docker library and then add all of your stuff on top of it, and then you deploy a bunch of them with the help of continuous integration and deployment um, that you can take up all of the spaces on some very large Amazon boxes alarmingly quickly. Um, so a couple of different tips, we'll walk through a couple of them, um, some language specific ones, some high level ones. Um, we're gonna go back to basics first. Uh, we're gonna talk about how Docker layers work. Uh, we'll cover the basics uh, for building more minimal images and why you should care about building minimal images in the first place. Um, we'll cover Windows. This is the first DockerCon with Windows officially. Um, so I'm excited. I know Elton is really excited. Um, <laughs> woo! Um, we're going to go through some Docker file examples, the good, the bad, and the bloated. Um, we're going to talk about Docker security scan. Um, and then we're going to cover a little bit of, but wait, there's more, um, and some, some things that we can look forward to in the future, or if you kind of want to go above and beyond. Um, but the main thing here, just some practical tips. You should be able to leave here from this session and use any of these um, in production or in development right now. And then we'll talk about some stuff that you can do some research on on your own. Um, so let's get rolling. Um, so how do layers work? Um, and this is one of the things that it seems really obvious and then they add up really quickly. Um, so before we start covering tips uh, for how we can have less layers, uh, let's talk about what layers actually are. Um, so you have the read-only container layers that make up the base operating system. So these belong to your OS, so Ubuntu or CentOS or whatever. These, these read-only layers make up your base image. And then anything you do with your container on top of that gets added to this thin read-write layer. So if you emit data in your container, if you write things, if you get files, those all go to that thin read-write layer and that gets that that gets stacked on top of your read-only container layers. Um, so we're looking at this diagram. It's really pretty. I made it myself. Um, but why do I care about this? You can tell that I'm not a graphic designer, by the way, because when Amazon makes the graphics for me, they look a lot better, and there's like spaceships and stuff. Um, but I have shapes there from PowerPoint. Why do I care about my container layers at all? Um, this is me. Um, more layers, larger image. And this is, I think, one of the most basic stuff about, about containers. But the more layers that I add, the bigger my image is going to be. The larger my image is, the longer it's going to take to both build or push and pull from a registry. So not only do smaller images, though, mean faster builds and faster deploys, um, but this means a smaller attack surface. So if you have a vulnerability in a package uh, and you use a base OS that has every package known to man in it, um, there's more spaces for people to get through, and there's more vulnerabilities that you have to worry about keeping updated. So the less of them you use, the less places you have for someone to attack you. Um, what we're going to focus on, I think, most here, though, is that these smaller images mean faster deploys, they mean faster builds, and they mean that you're using your resources more efficiently. So don't be me. Don't be Abby. Don't get woken up at 2 AM because you have no disk space left, um, and all the auto scaling in the world can only rescue you for so long. Um, so why do we care about this, though? So yes, more efficient, builds faster, deploys faster. Um, this is becoming more of a problem. So it used to be that maybe you deployed once a day or you deployed once a week, or if you worked at a really big company with a really big monolith, maybe you deployed once every two weeks. Um, but now that's not really how it works for everyone. A lot of companies are moving towards microservices with containers, and they're doing continuous integration and continuous deployment. So, if you have your one giant two gigabyte image and you only deploy it once every two weeks, not a huge deal. It'll catch up with you eventually, but it's not that big of a problem. But if you deploy that same two gigabyte image and you have 
even 10 services, 15 services, 20 services, and you deploy all those a couple of times a day, a couple of times a week, think about how much space is kind of going unused and idle and you're, all the time that you're waiting for this giant bloated image to go out that you could be spending doing other things. So either better work-related things or literally anything else. So I did this on Twitch Live the other week where I pulled a stock image and did this, this is live, in front of a bunch of people showing about how ECR worked, which is Amazon's container registry. Um, so we spent 15 minutes with my slow home internet waiting for an image to download, which was the best possible illustration I could have had for why I shouldn't have done that. And I had to embarrass myself on Twitch for people to see that, but it was a really good illustration, right? And that there are better ways to do this. You deploy a lot, you build a lot, let's make things better. So how can I reduce the number of layers? So these are some really high level tips, but like we learned in kindergarten, sharing is caring. So use shared base images wherever possible. Uh, limit the data that you're writing to that read write container layer. Uh, chain your run statements and prevent cache misses at build time for as long as possible. So we're gonna cover all of these in a little or a lot more detail depending on the bullet. Um, but let's cover uh, our basics, not language specific, of how we can build uh, some more minimal images. Um, so if you're joining me, hopefully you know what a Docker file is. Um, if you do not, if you're keeping following us from home, a Docker file is a series of instructions for building an image. So you've all seen this, you've all used them. If you haven't used them, it's something like from base image or run command. Um, so hopefully we've all seen them. If you've not, you're gonna see a bunch of them. Um, so good. This is my Wu-Tang logo. Um, it's about cash though. So cash now rules everything around me. So I'm the new Wu-Tang. Um, this is important. This is one of our most basic things, and it sounds, it's one of those things like with what our layers have less of them that sound really intuitive, but are really important in practice. So anything that you can cache, you probably should, with some exceptions, but if you think about it this way, so if you're building every single time, think about all the things that you do, and think about if a container like you do starting up like a new EC2 box or just a new server, all the things that go into setting that up. Your, updating your packages, you're installing new packages, um, you're maybe doing some configuration, you're maybe doing some setup that doesn't need to happen every time. Um, and if you don't use the cache effectively, um, you're gonna have to do that every time also. Um, so anything that's unchanged between builds, um, you can use the cache for. Uh, and there's some exceptions for that. So if you have a command that doesn't change that pulls a different file, so the example that's passed around a lot for this is pulling from GitHub, um, your command hasn't changed, but the actual output is. So there's some, thumb, some things you don't want Docker to use the cache for. Uh, but in general, you wanna let Docker cache everything that it can. Um, anything that you can be reused that's already in the cache, let's keep it. Um, it's a really small step, it saves us a bunch of time. Um, and it's that, that we're back to our same sharing is caring principle, that if I've already pulled it once and nothing's changed, why would I pull it again? Uh, it's just some time that we don't need to we don't need to waste there. Um, you can do a whole presentation, by the way, on just how Docker uses the cache. Um, and that is not this presentation, um, but you could. So there's a ton out there. Definitely look at the Docker documentation for anything that I'm covering here, by the way. So there's a ton of information out there. People have written huge blog posts and huge pages of documentation on pretty much every single small piece of how a Docker file works and how the instructions work. So what we're covering is some practical tips that you can use in production for how to make your images smaller, but there's more details out there uh, for all of this. Um, so let's start with our basics. So we're gonna start with our Docker file again. Um, this is kind of, this is my biggest possible, well, it's not my biggest possible, so challenge accepted. We could make one way bigger than this, but in the interests of our demo purposes, um, this is our starting point. So we're pulling the latest and greatest Ubuntu image. Um, also another caveat here, I'm using Ubuntu as my example a lot. Uh, I added an Ubuntu sticker to my laptop to let them know that I still love them. Um, they're just my example. Um, this is something, by the way, that the same incident that got me paged at two o'clock in the morning, this is the image that I would have used in production before I thought a little bit about um, how I could make these better and how I could make these more effective. This is something I would have done. Um, so I'm pulling my latest and greatest Ubuntu image. Uh, I labeled it nicely with my maintainer label. 
I'm updating uh, my packages, and then I'm installing some things that I need to run my Python app. Um, I'm copying over my actual app itself. I'm changing my directory. Uh, I'm running pip install for my Python requirements. I'm exposing a port, and then I'm running my, my actual application. So pretty simple, really readable. Um, this is something I would have done, actually, if I could go back far enough to the company that I worked for when I originally started working with Docker, you'd probably see something that looks just about exactly like this. Um, it works. I could do it really fast, um, but we can make it a little bit better. Um, our first step here is always going to be choosing the right base, and we're going to talk a little bit later about what happens when I'm choosing, what happens when I should choose my own base or when I should write my own, and we're going to talk about that also. But our first step here, and this is just an example, again, I'm picking on Ubuntu. I'm so sorry. Um, here's our latest stock Ubuntu image when I wrote this presentation. 458 megs. Uh, it's one of those things that doesn't sound super big until you try to use this in production and you realize that you're adding a bunch of stuff on top of it. And also, what happens when I have 10 or 15 or 20 microservices all based off of the Ubuntu image that's all coming in at over 400 megs? No bueno. So let's look at just another example. So our Python 2.7 from Alpine container, 86.8 megs. So just one illustration, and there are literally hundreds of these comparisons that we can do. One example of how choosing a different base container that's possibly better for the language that I'm working in and better for my application um, can have a huge space implication. So that means this container is going to build faster, it's going to deploy faster, and I can deploy more of them before I have to pay for more resources to store more containers. I'm cheap. Um, we have tons of these. Um, we'll talk a little bit also about some of the trade-offs for when I maybe don't want one of the really slim or really minimal base images. There are times for that too, so there's a time for everything. Uh, but example number one. So slightly better, let's choose something else. So here's a couple different examples. So we have our Alpine latest coming in at a teeny, teeny 3.9 megs. We have some Python examples. We have a couple of different Linux distros up here. Really just an example, guys. So you can use, use the tool that's right for you, use the distro that's right for you, use the base that's right for you, but don't pick something that's bigger than it needs to be just because it's something that it's easy to pull from Docker Hub. Um, so we're gonna look at a little bit more tips on how we could make this better. Um, oh, as promised, we have a small digression here. So when do I want a full OS? So Abby, you just spent 10 minutes talking about why this OS is so big. When would I possibly want it? So just like my sticker, I do actually like Ubuntu. Ubuntu, I'll tweet you, I love you. Um, a couple of reasons though. So compliance, so not everyone works at a tiny startup. So I've been doing ops for startups. I could pretty much pick whatever base image I want because um, there's probably no one else that's gonna ask any questions about it. Um, but compliance, guys. So if you work for a bigger company, if you work for a bank, like these are every, companies in every possible industry and in every possible business sector uh, can be using containers and they can be using Docker. Um, but some people have more compliance rules to follow than others. Uh, same with security. Uh, and finally, and I think this is one that is a little, is more intuitive, but it's more of a general thing, but ease of development. So we're gonna talk about some of these trade-offs. So what goes into kind of building up one of those really minimal and lightweight base images into something that I can actually use. But ease of development is one of them. And that would have been the biggest reason for me at a startup uh, why I would have pulled kind of a stock OS image. Um, it's really, it can be really frustrating for a new user that's never really used Docker before to be like, okay, so I have my Alpine image and then but there's nothing in it. And then it's like, okay, well, it's okay. I'll curl this file to install it. Nope, there's no curl in there. So there's definitely some, there's some trade-offs here. There's work that goes into setting up one of these base images. So for ease of development, often it is easier to use one of the full ones, but if you're trying to optimize, if you're trying to get the most of your resources, uh, let's power forward. Um, so we're looking at our original Ubuntu image. This is the same thing that we just looked at. Um, we're installing from our base image, we're installing our packages, we're updating our packages. This is the same thing as before, but just a recap since we just talked about Ubuntu. Um, this is the same image from our size comparison before. So we've moved from our Ubuntu latest image to our Python 2.7 Alpine image, um, which was a, it's a more minimal image. It's, it was uh, put together for Python applications. 
um, and it was based off of Alpine. Um, you'll notice that two of my lines have disappeared, and that is because I don't need them anymore. So we're using, before, when we were using a full OS, we were using something that was designed to run any application, but, so if you start off a new server, so if you log into your AWS console and you start up an EC2 instance, um, you have to install some stuff to make your Python app work. You don't necessarily, when we've picked a container that is appropriate for this. So we're using our Python container, we can skip all this stuff about installing Python packages, because they're already there. So we're copying over our app again, the same as before, we're changing our directory to our app. Uh, we're running pip install to get our Python requirements. But that's it. So we've cut out a couple steps here. So not only, not only have we cut off some space just by picking a different base image, but we no longer have to do this install step. So a small change that gets us a pretty significant result. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier, which is my Wu-Tang picture. Cache rules everything around me. It's really funny, by the way. Um, Fewer cache invalidations means smaller images. So think about the order that you do things. So if I have a file and I only want to run the command if, so once you've invalidated the cache, and this is maybe something I should have said a couple slides ago, but it's too late. Um, once you've invalidated the cache, once you, once, you, once you run an instruction that's invalidated it, you run every subsequent child command after that. So, if you, can, if you can put off invalidating the cache, or something like a run statement that's going to invalidate it, put everything you can before that, just get it done first. If you know you're going to invalidate the cache, hold that off as long as possible so you're not running a ton of stuff that you don't need to just because you invalidated the cache a couple steps earlier. Um, this means that some things, they end up in a different order for containers and for Docker files than they might if you were doing this not in a container. Um, so now I can switch this a little bit further. So I can copy my requirements.txt file over, and then I can run pip install, but I'm doing that early. Um, so th the further that I can push off the cache invalidation, the smaller my image is going to be. Um, the same thing for this, right? So I have application code. Um, I can use on build instructions for this, um, which basically says I'm, I'm using my Docker file, but I'm saying don't run this until on build. So I can, it's, like, it's like doing all the setup, and then when I actually build that image, so when I actually deploy it somewhere, when I build it, when I run it, um, run that instruction then. So in this case, we've passed off adding our uh, requirements and our pip install, uh, and that little dot there, which I'm assuming is kind of hard to see from all the way back there, that dot's just copying all my application code into my slash app directory. Um, but this is just an order thing. So I've changed my order around, I've moved some things to on build, uh, I can just pass this off, and I can run this on build instead of, instead of doing it before then. A um, little bit cleaner, a little bit smaller, a little bit nicer. Um, so let's recap. Um, so in short, layers are file system differences. These add up really quickly. They have really big consequences. So the more things that I do to that thin read-write layer on top of the layers that make up my base image, the larger my container is going to be, the longer it's going to take to build, the longer it's going to take to deploy. Um, and on top of that, or below that, if I'm being funny, um, if I can pick a base image that in turn has less layers, my total stack is going to have less layers. And less layers, smaller container. Um, so let's power through. So some high-level best practices, because this is Elton's moment in the sun. Um, we're going to shout out Elton's session, though, so just wait. Um, so this is, again, first DockerCon with Windows. This is exciting. Um, there's a couple of tools out there to make, this, to make this easier, which I think is, I think is really important. So I think that there's, for some of the Windows workloads, it's not, it's not as easy to make kind of the intuitive jump over from a, like a, a full Windows VM image uh, to a Docker container. They can be pretty big. Docker containers are not usually like that if we've listened to any of my session or if you had read the documentation before. Um, so there are tools out there to make this process a little bit easier. Uh, so we can run convert to Docker file. Uh, we can convert over our Windows image. Um, and that means that what you get from this output is you can run this, win you can build and run this Windows container uh, like any other Docker container. So at this point, you've jumped the divide between your Windows OS or your Linux OS or whatever it is you're doing over there. You've now bridged that gap. So you can build and run that container the exact same way, regardless of distribution. And that's something that, like, 
it's like, okay, well, I read the documentation and I know how to run Docker containers. And it's like, but this is really incredible. So being able to build and run something the exact same way and deploy it the exact same way onto the same infrastructure, regardless of language, is huge. And I think it's one of the, maybe over, it's something that it sounds so obvious that it doesn't get mentioned as much, but like this, port this portability and repeatability is really important. And it's something that can solve a lot of problems for a lot of different developers. Um, so we've made our, our Windows container, we've built it, we've run it the same way. Um, some things to think about. Um, so this is gonna sound really intuitive also. There's two Windows options. There's a nano server and there's the full server. Um, obviously, nano server is gonna be way smaller, but just like we talked about when you need a full base OS, uh, the same applies for Windows, right? So you might still need the full Windows image. Um, so watch what you build. Um, I can't stress this enough. If you try to build one of these paths, you're gonna have a sad day. Uh, one, I think there's some PRs out and the, I've been trying to keep up with them, but there are, the Docker, the Docker project is very popular and there's lots of PRs happening and I, sometimes I have to do my actual job so I can't keep up with them. Um, there's some PRs out there and I'm not sure whether, what the status is about explicitly forbidding some of these. So to save you from yourself, um, do not build these. Seriously, do not build them. It will be so big, it will take so long, it will mess so many things up. And if you do build them, I'm gonna reply to you on Twitter with just a picture of this. And it's, I told you. Um, there's a second thing um, that I think is, I would not have known about this until I started playing with it, um, but you cannot or should not install packages on Windows images the same way that you can on Linux images. So I'll be the first to admit I am a Linux and Mac kind of girl. I'm not a Windows expert. And I would have been like, whatever. If I can run this the same way, I can install packages the same way. That is not true. Um, MSI installations, they are not space efficient. So in Lin when you install things on Linux distros, and we're gonna cover this a little bit later when we look at Dockerfy examples, um, you can, if you add, use, and remove an installation file in the same run statement, so in the same command, that's effectively not there anymore. What you installed is there, but if you can add, use, and remove like something like curl in the same layer, it's gone, and it doesn't get added to the total size of your Docker file. Windows is sneaky, and you can't do that. So when you use the MSI installs, and you install it, and you're like, okay, so I've used my package, and I've gotten rid of it, I'm good, right? You are not good. Windows saves everything for later, for something, and I don't know, but technically it's for uninstalls, which makes sense. So if I'm on my Windows computer, which I have one somewhere, if I, if I install something, Windows always very helpfully gives me an uninstall shortcut. This is terrific. Not so terrific in containers, where I know that I can clean up and be responsible for my own garbage collecting. Uh, be very wary of MSI installs. Uh, Windows will save them, try to avoid them where possible, but they will add files in sneaky locations and you will not be able to reasonably clean them up in your Docker file, which can add to your total image size. Um, but for more Windows tips, check out Elton session. Uh, it's called Escape from Your VMs. It's tomorrow in this very same ballroom, which I think is a really fancy way and I like hearing it called that. Um, it's at 225. He knows way more about Windows than I do. Um, I stole all the cool trips about MSI, but he's got other stuff. Um, so go and check that out. They know way more than me. Um, let's power through to our Docker files. Um, so I've named this the good, the bad, and the bloated, which I also think is really funny. Um, so let's start out big. So we're starting from our saying, this is our really familiar Docker file, and I'm sure at some point everyone is super tired of looking at this. I'm tired of looking at the same Docker file. Um, from Ubuntu latest, we're installing all of our things. We have not, we've noticed though that I've made this a little bit more efficient, which, inefficient, which hurts my soul. Um, but we're running our apt get update and we're running our apt get install. We're running those in different lines. Everything else is the same. We've split those off into two, two lines, which is something that I would have thought about like a couple years ago and I would have been like, great, look at how much more readable this is. I could comment both of these lines and I could leave myself in instructions and I am a gift to developers because look at, look at how nicely I've written this. Look at how many comments I've left. And although that's nice in theory, it's not really that nice in practice when it eats all my disk space. Um, so I didn't highlight this properly apparently, but all I've done here is I've added them into one line. So they're being run in one step 
And I've added another special thing. It says no install recommends, and PowerPoint ruins my, my dash formatting, because um, apparently they did not write it to put code in. Um, but don't, no install recommends. This is a fancy way. Of, do not install the recommended packages. You don't always need them. You do need them a lot of time, but you don't always need them. Um, so when you install something on any distribution, it installs, and you've seen this if you've watched like an apt get install on a Linux box, on an Ubuntu box, you've seen this where it says, and the following 79 other packages will also be installed. Um, this is fine. It will solve you, a lot. it will save you from a lot of problems, and a lot of those are development headers, or things that your packages might require, or things that you might need later, or things that other developers have commonly used. This is really nice, and it's a nice thing that they did. Um, not always great when we're trying to build our minimal containers, um, so if we add that flag, we can avoid installing some packages that we probably don't need, and if it turns out that we do need them, we can explicitly install them. Um, so let's try our different base again. Um, this is the same thing as before. By switching to a base that's appropriate for the language that we're using, we can save ourselves time and frustration. So some of these same packages that I had to install, ooh, back button. Um, some of these same things that I had to install explicitly before, so Python pip, Python dev, build essential. Build essential for some reason, it seems like every single package under the sun requires build essential. And I spend a lot of time writing that into files, and I'm not sure why I don't just script something. It says, if I'm doing anything, install build essential. Um, so install that, but we don't need them anymore. So we've saved ourselves some time. This is the same example that we looked at before though, right? So by using a different base, we can skip instructions, we can skip layers, we can make it smaller. Um, so we can also try a custom base container. And Abby, why would I want to write a custom base container if I could use someone else's base container? And that's the same question that I asked myself. Uh, why do I want to do that? It sounds like more work. It sounds like two places that I have to keep something up to date. Uh, well, we can pass off a bunch of stuff in these steps, right? So if I have Python requirements that don't frequently change, so if I know that I have some requirements to run my server, but they don't frequently change, I can shove all that off in a base image somewhere else. Especially, so previously, I worked at a company called Airtime, and we, ran, we were a Node.js shop. And we found ourselves installing a lot of the same packages for a lot of different apps in a lot, like a lot of different times. And why would I want to do that? So I run my life by the principle of lazy ops. So if I have to do something more than once, why would I want to do it? I should have something else do it. So base image we can push off all of our kind of base requirements. So common requirements that are shared between services, common things for the base, so our Python setup requirements, let's put those somewhere else. And especially, so we talked about sharing is caring, and I can't go back that many slides. Um, sharing is caring. So if I have a Node.js shop or a Python shop and I can use that shared base image for a bunch of different services, think about all the things that those images can share instead, leaving me with more space for activities on my box. Um, so, we've used our custom base image here, um, and you'll notice that my pip, ins my, my, my pip install step has gone somewhere else. And this is a bad example because I only had one thing that I wanted to move to my base image, but pretend that it's real life. We could move a bunch more stuff there. We could save ourselves a lot of time. Uh, and it just means that, yes, there is one extra step, but I think it's worth the space gains. Um, I can only build that base requirement, that base image when something specific has changed, like my pip requirements. Um, so let's rock on before I go extremely over time. Um, use our run statements effectively. So we looked at a really brief example of this earlier when we went from having our apt get update and our apt get install in two separate lines. We can put those, we can be a little bit more effective. So we're doing a couple extra things here. So one, we're running our update and we're running our install in the same line, so that's great. We're also pinning a version, so S3 command, uh, we've pinned it. Uh, that means that we're not going to update to a version that we don't want or try to get the latest version if we don't care about it. So we're not gonna waste time trying to update or trying to pull a different version um, if we know that we're good with that one. And then finally, we're doing a little bit extra here. We are garbage collecting. So we are cleaning up um, all of our little install files in the same line. So that means that although the packages have stayed around, my install files have not. And since we've done that, we, since we've 
uh, added, used, and removed those packages in the same line, they are effectively not there anymore. So we have not saved them in our final image size. Um, this is another kind of gotcha. Switching user adds layers. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, I have a Node.js example. But basically, when, if you add a new user and you switch to it, and then you run a command as that new user, um, and then you switch back again, you're adding yourself a layer. Every time you switch that user, you're adding a layer. Uh, and a lot of containers will come with this out of the box. So like the Node.js image will come with the Node user out of the box. If you can do everything as a non, if you have to switch users, so if you need that specific user for something, um, do that first. Make sure that you've switched to that user, do your stuff as that user, but don't switch back and forth needlessly. Um, all you're doing is adding space and you really probably don't need to. Um, this applies for pretty much any language also. Just every time you switch it, you have to, and it goes back to I think one of the kind of the core container principles, which is have a single responsibility for a container. If you're finding that you need to switch uh, users all the time because they're doing different tasks, consider maybe that that container should have been separated out into multiple containers, uh, and that way everything is only doing the job that it's responsible for. Um, this is one of the, that sounds kind of simple, avoid adding large files. So this is a bad example. It's crop.com slash big thing. Um, I've installed it, I've run it, and then I'm running another make command. Um, better, I'm running it, I'm using curl to get the file, and then I'm piping it into my tar command, and then I'm running make. That is slightly better, curl is slightly better. Here's what's best. I'm both running, I'm curling it, I'm doing the things that I need to, and then, oh my God, I'm removing the big thing. So like, if I have a file, and I need it to do something, but I don't need the file afterwards, let's not keep it. Because that just means, like, when you think about how you're deploying containers, so if I don't get rid of that cruft.bigthing.tar, if I don't get rid of that, I'm replicating that out, maybe a hundred times, to a bunch of different boxes across a giant cluster, for, but I don't use it anymore? Like I use it and then I never use it again. It does, that doesn't seem like it's something that's important to have in my container. Um, I'm anti-hoarders. Um, so let's just get rid of that. That's best. So avoid, avoid getting it that way. When you can, let's curl it. Let's use it. And let's not save it for later. Um, so let's get language specific. Um, a few language specific best practices. So use the right tool. Not every language needs to be built the same way. Um, where possible, use two images. And we'll talk about this a little bit later because there's some exciting stuff. Uh, one to build an artifact and one from base. And official languages can be, official Im language images can be huge. So more space effective to use a minimal image. But as I mentioned earlier, there are trade-offs to this. Um, and we'll talk about some specific uh, trade-offs for when you maybe want the, the official image versus rolling your own. But let's rock. First stop, Golang. Um, we're compiling it. And then we're copying it over. So Go images, so I'd say Go, Ruby, and Java, not that I'm naming any names, because I'm not, um, tend to be extra huge. And there are reasons why they're extra huge, um, but life does not have to be like that. Um, so Go is a good place to use Scratch. And if you've never used Scratch before, you're missing out. But basically, well, you're not missing out on a lot of work to set it up to use it for something, but you are missing out on saving a lot of space. So Scratch, basically, it's basically empty. So it's an image, but there's nothing in it. Um, so what I can do, though, is that I can compile my Go stuff, and then I can copy the binary over, and then from my Docker file, I can just use the Scratch file. So I can run from Scratch, I can copy my stuff over, and I can just run my app. So this is what I was saying this slide. I can build an artifact, and then I can actually use that somewhere else. This is exactly what we're doing. We're building it, we're copying it, we're running it somewhere else. Um, we have to rock on, because the clock is gonna start beeping at me. Um, so let's look at Ruby, which is our other culprit for places with giant images. Um, a new base plus a little extra work is gonna pay off here. So we can use our Alpine again to build from Ruby. Um, so we're using Alpine, same stuff as before, but you'll notice that one, our, package, our packages have changed. So we're using APK, so the Alpine's package manager instead. Um, you'll notice that we're installing curl, which I called out earlier, but basically Alpine ships with very little, and I have to explicitly add what I want on top of that. 
Um, the caveat here is that especially with Ruby, when you're using, when you're working with Ruby, you're working with Ruby gems. Uh, each gem seems to have like 10 other gems that it requires on, or development headers or something. And you need all of those. When, you get, when you're working with something like Alpine, you're not gonna get them out of the box. So if you're looking for ease of development, so maybe you're just testing out something locally, uh, for ease of development, the, the official image is probably going to have, which is part of the reason why it's so huge, all the headers and extra dependencies that you're gonna need for your gems. Um, but when you're working with Alpine, when you're working in a situation where space matters, uh, you'll have to install all of those yourself. So big space wins requires a little bit of extra work. Um, finally, Node.js. Um, here's another pro tip from things Abby has done wrong, um, which actually could be its own presentation, and I'll make a note of that. Um, if you love yourself at all, docker ignore the npm debug.log. Seriously, it's a good tip. Um, docker ignore in general is actually pretty cool. So you guys have mo probably mostly written git ignore files, the same thing. If it doesn't belong in version control, you can write git ignore. Uh, if it does not belong in your docker file, you can run in your docker container, uh, there's also Docker Ignore also. Um, so if you have, I don't know, stuff. So log files that you only needed locally because you're going to use an actual real life logger in adult production circumstances, just Docker Ignore it. You don't need it. Leave it out. Um, these things, these kind of things, so especially we're just going to call out Node. Node npm debug.log is like enormous. And I can't, it's just huge. And there's really no reason that it needs to be in a container. Um, so do that. But most importantly, Cache your node modules. Um, so this is something else that I've done wrong in production, which I'm sure people are tweeting about now. Um, copy your package.json, um, run your install, and then worry about copying your app code. So only run your npm install if the package.json changes. So remember we talked about caching. It's only gonna run this it's if the uh, Docker runs a checksum, right? So it only, it only runs that if the checksum for the file has changed. So if we haven't changed our NPM install, if we haven't added any new packages or whatever, don't do it again. Like, that seems, seems silly. So let's move that first, and then we'll deal with our app code, which we know has changed later. Um, so only run that NPM install, NPM install again. If you need to, cache is our friend. Um, build stages. Um, so this is kind of an early example of the syntax. So uh, this is a new announcement also that I think we just heard this morning. Um, so we're gonna cover it really quick and there should be a much better and greater Docker blog post or something about this later. But at a high level, this is letting you do a couple of things. It's letting you run your first install step and then use that somewhere else. So in our example, and this is particularly good by the way for things like Go, or for Java and Maven installs where you need a lot of stuff to build like initially, but you don't need it afterwards. So let's push that out. So from our Ubuntu, but as build env, so we're running our new container, we're running it as something else. I'm doing a bunch of, so like apt get install, we're adding a bunch of things. So this might be where I'm doing my Maven stuff. Um, I have basically built that as our first section. And then on top of that, I'm using, I don't know why I'm pointing that in there. Um, I can copy, so I'm copying from buildemf, which is what we just, I wish I had a laser pointer. I'm copying over from my buildemf, which I just made. So it's, a, it's, like, it's like Docker recycling. So I've like named these two things. I'm doing all the stuff that takes a lot of space. I'm doing that first, and then I'm using it somewhere else. But I don't need to have those things because I've already, I've already built the stuff. Like I've already used all the things that are taking up space. So now I'm just doing my lightweight and fast stuff on top of that. Um, I'm sure that Docker will have a better and more official explanation, but I'm really excited about this. Because um, if you're using it right and if you're labeling things right and if, if you're separating things out intuitively, uh, you can save yourself an incredible amount of space. Um, tools are here to help. I promise we're almost done. Apparently I talk a lot. Um, Docker security scan. So part of this thing about using base images or minimal images from other people, um, this image, by the way, came from Docker. There's no need to take a picture. It's in their documentation. You too can steal it. Um, it's, it seems too hard to make my own. Um, but basically, you, Docker security scan, so you can run it on your own. Um, so it runs for the three most recent tags. You can push to an old tag to trigger a new scan. Um, it also runs for official images, so like Alpine or Python or Nginx. Um, and the root of this is don't trust anybody. Um, so if you're using, 
I wouldn't just like take a box from Elton and like use it to build something without looking what was in it. So the same thing, same thing applies to base images. So if I know that there's like a, a security vulnerability out there, I don't want to blindly use that package. So know before you use it. Um, it's like the New York subway. If you see something, say something. This is what Docker Security Scan is doing. It's running all the time. It's looking for vulnerabilities, and then it's it's making them it's making them known to you uh, on Docker Hub. Um, Another one that I don't see used super often, but uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so we have image prune and we have system prune. Um, so Docker image prune is going to get rid of all of your dangling images. So untagged things, images that aren't being used by a container anymore. Um, you don't need them, so let's not keep them around. Um, you can run Docker image prune. Um, also good practice to kind of garbage collect if, if you're running like a cluster, so like an ECS cluster or a Kubernetes cluster or something. Good practice to garbage collect on all of these also. Um, but clean yourself up locally also. So Docker image prune, um, Docker, Docker system prune will go an extra step further and will remove volumes and stuff like that uh, also. But basically, the same thing is why you want to clean up your, your apt packages or your install packages or your MSI packages. Um, be a good Docker citizen. So if you're installing something and you don't need it anymore, if you created an image and you don't need it anymore, uh, Clean it up. Um, all you're doing is kind of avoiding problems for yourself in the future. Um, so a little bit of cleaning up uh, can let you develop longer in peace without worrying about uh, whether you've taken up all the space in your boxes. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, looking forward to the future. Um, this is really quick. There's always more. So as this ecosystem evolves, more advancements for smaller images. Um, so we talked about things that you could really just do in production, like right away, that you could go back, you could look at the order of your install steps, you could look at your cleanup steps, you could look at your base images. These are all things that you could do right now, um, but there's more stuff out there. Um, you can build your own OS. So there's Nix, uh, which is a project that I think everyone should look into, but it's basically taking it one step lower. So why use someone else's OS when you could use your own? Um, Unikernels for Docker. Uh, and then always new, more minimal base images designed for containers. So there's Alpine, there's Rancher, there's all kinds of things out there. Uh, and there's been enough interest, because I'm guessing enough people got paged at 2 o'clock in the morning, that there's a lot of interest out there for people looking for more and more uh, minimal images, because they're looking to be more effective, uh, more smaller, deploy faster, build faster. Um, it's a real problem for a lot of people. Um, so there's always new tools out there to, to kind of help you. Um, and finally, Quick and dirty recap, so what did we learn? Um, that's what I'll say. Um, one takeaway, if you learned anything from here, um, less layers is more, so share things where possible. Uh, choose or build your own base wisely. Uh, not all languages should build the same. Uh, keep it simple, avoid extras, uh, and tools are here to help. Um, that is all, I am very much negatively out of time. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs>